Thank you. When Mark was reading my my uh, my brief bio, I was surprised. I thought, well, is it me? <laughs> so thank you so much for those uh, kind words. Uh, I'm Malawian, so we have a protocol. Before you speak, you have to recognize some people. So allow me to recognize Mr. Mark Tonfry, and I hope I'm pronouncing that name very well. Downfridge. Okay. Director, ICD Academy for Cultural Diplomacy. I recognize the Malawi Deputy uh, Ambassador for the, to the Federal Republic of uh, Germany and all members of staff of the embassy, our director from the Ministry of Tourism and all the staff that we have come with from Malawi and all distinguished guests of the Berlin Economic Forum, members of the press, if they are here, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. I am very, very humbled that I could stand before you today and I bring you the warmest greetings from my country, uh, Malawi, and I'm going to explain why we are called the warm heart of Africa. There's a reason why they call us the warm heart of Africa. And I, I recognize that around the table, around the room, we may have some people that may be the first time that you're hearing about Malawi, so I need to give you an overview of who we are. So we are a country in the southern part of Africa. We are neighboring Zambia, Tanzania, and uh, Mozambique. So uh, we are in the southern part uh, of Africa. So we are, I think, the central part right there, down there. And one of our greatest uh, natural endowments would be the uh, Lake Malawi National Park. And Lake Malawi, which is uh, one of the freshest uh, waters around the world. But I think I want to talk about who you are, because I think I've, having been at the ITB, I've, I've seen a lot of things that are making my mind change a little bit in terms of uh, what it is that we have to offer. So for example, they are saying, if you go to Seychelles, Mauritius, uh, Zambia, Malawi, uh, or Zimbabwe, everyone has a lake, everyone has a beach, you know, there's a the sunshine. People, I, was, I, I went to the Rwandan uh, um, uh, stand today. I went to the Zimbabwean one, I went to the Ethiopian one, Kenyan one, because I wanted to experience, because I've just been in post, I think for a month now, and then I want to uh, understand the fact that I have a lot to learn, and especially from my African counterparts as much as I can learn from the European counterparts as well. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I'm saying, okay, everybody has a, a lake, everybody has a beach, and I'm talking about beaches in seashells, they are incredible. And they can never be compared, especially in terms of infrastructure to, to, to what we have. But I was saying, what is that thing that gives us a comparative advantage over the other? You know, what's that competitive edge that we have that everybody else doesn't have? And that's exactly what I want to bring out to you today. What is it that makes us the warm heart of Africa and why do we have to position Malawi as a go-to destination uh, in the world? I want to talk about those things. You too are disturbing my thought, of, my thought process. You're moving around <laughs> a lot. So anyway, we sat down as a country and decided to say, where do we want to take our country in the next 40 years, for example? So we developed what we are calling the MW 2063, the Malawi Vision 2063, which is a blueprint of what we want to do for the next 40 years, from now to the next 40 years. And under that, we have what we call the MIP-1, which is the Malawi Implementation uh, Plan 1. You can find this on the National Planning Commission website, National Planning Commission website, if you want to see these documents. Because, and we even changed the law to ensure that everybody is in sync with that as far as politics is concerned. Because we wanted to move away from the political settlement issues where governments come in and go, and then this one comes in and then they stop everything that the other government was doing because of political subsistence and all of that. So what we did, we changed the law to say, when you're coming, even when you're campaigning, your manifesto has to show how you're going to achieve the objectives as, enshri as enshrined. Uh, in the MW 2063. So the MW 2063, as we call it, um, has placed two issues at the center of our structural transformation. And number one would be the uh, uh, tourism, and number two is the mining. So I think, as you know, uh, mining, it takes a little bit of time for you to start leveraging on everything that you're going to harness from there. But we're looking at now tourism as a, a better goal to as far as our social economic development is concerned. And that's where I'm coming in. We, and that also kind of like gives us pressure as a ministry, but also as people to say, uh, everyone is relying on us to ensure that we take it home. We have been having challenges as far as uh, Forex is concerned, and that has affected our fuel uh, supplies and everything else uh, that we are facing in our country. But I don't want to focus on those things because, I mean, let's be honest, who doesn't have challenges? But life has to go on, and that's not what I'm bringing to the table today. What I'm bringing to the table is something that is over and above um, what uh, tourism products we have in our country. So the, the ambassador here was talking about the lake, was talking about the wildlife that we have. But I think something else that we have as a country that is no one else is going to give you 
in anywhere else across the world is the people of Malawi, the culture behind it, the stories behind those people. Because even in their greatest poverty, they'll still give you the warmth from the depth of their souls. That's what Malawi gives you. And I can guarantee you that any person around the world that comes to my country, even if just for two days, their life will never be the same. I met a young man in Scotland as I was working for Malawi Scotland Partnership, and he told me, I stay in Malawi, I will never in my life ever take anything for granted. And I asked him why. He said to me, I had an opportunity to go to a school and I had I was involved in building uh, a school and then they did a sports, I think they had, a, we call it a exchange visits. They had a partner school in Malawi with a, it had partnered with Scotland. And he said, you went there and he was staying in a village for two weeks. He said, I couldn't imagine, believe with my eyes that people would have so little and then they'll be 100% committed towards getting an education. And here in Scotland, we have everything at our disposal but we don't commit the same way. And because of that, and you know, that's something that you cannot put in words, really. And that's exactly, and that did hit me. I said, that's the leverage that Malawi has. You come to Malawi, you never, never be the same. And so in April uh, 2022, the President of the Republic of Malawi, uh, His Excellency, Dr. Lazarus Chagwe, he launched our master plan of tourism. It's a 10-year master plan. Uh, that is articulating the about 103 projects that we want to, to do. And so in those projects, we have uh, the low-hanging fruits, the medium one, and then the, the long-term uh, goals. But then I think the master plan is also articulating 10 specific projects that we want by any means necessary. We need to have them. And they have something to do with the lake. They have something to do with our wildlife and everything else, but also about culture. For example, we have um, the Mulanje, uh, Mulanje uh, Mountain. Uh, we want to put cable cars uh, on Mulanje Mountain. It's one of the, it's the third largest uh, uh, mountain in Africa, and we want to put cable mountains there. We want to put up a resort in, in, in Likoma Island, which is one of the most habitable uh, islands in the world. Uh, and also, we want to put up a hotel, uh, Golden Sands, at uh, Lake Malawi National Park. By the way, Lake Malawi National Park, Lake Malawi alone has over 1,000 species of fish which is the largest species of water any other body of water in the world has. And 700 of those species are found at Lake Malawi National Park. It's incredible. You look, talk about colors, blue, any color of blue, you find a kind, a kind of fish there. It was, it was really uh, incredible. And that place is the safest snorkeling place in the world. And it is also a UNESCO uh, World Heritage. And it is one of, it is the first freshwater uh, uh, national park in the world that was also the first in the world to inhabit even people. So you go to Lake Malawi National Park, you're able to see the lake, you're able to see the park, you're able to see everything else. It's incredible. But like I said, that's not what I'm selling you today. That's not what I'm telling people today. At the ITB, that's not what I'm telling people. What I'm telling people is the experience that Malawians have that they are going to bring and that is going to change your life. Because we, when you change one life, we have changed the world because that person is going to impact another person who is going to impact another person. That's how we look at things uh, in Malawi. So having said that, um, they were asking me to say, Minister, you are here now for a month. What is your plan? And I'm saying I have three key goals because I know from the political perspective, I'm here for a very short period of time. In the next six months, the president may decide to send me to energy or anywhere else, or I may lose my job. So I'm okay with that. But the issue is, in my capacity now, with the power, with the, the, the privilege that I've been given today, what is it that I want to do? And the first thing that I want to do is to ensure that we demystify tourism. In my country, tourism is considered as something that people that have money do. You know, so we want we have to demystify tourism. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that we need to rely on ourselves. And I think our resilience as a nation is well documented. We had to fight and we we had we lost very, very few people in, in the COVID-19 pandemic. But that's not the point. The point is how people were able to help each other, even in their poverty, even in our need. We were able to reach out to each other, to support each other and to save lives. Now we are fighting a cholera pandemic, an outbreak. We're able to do the same thing. So our resilience as a people is well, well documented. So the first thing that we want to do is to demystify tourism. I want tourism to be involved, to, to everybody to be involved in tourism. That lake that we are talking about belongs to all the 19 million of us, but it is an anomaly that we must correct. If we have people that would be born in Malawi, die at 70 years of, of, of age, and they've never seen the lake, we must correct that. Why should we correct that? It's because, for example, when we had the COVID-19 pandemic, people were not moving. And then there was a time when, because of our austerity measures that we are following in government, 
the, the, the office of the president put up a, a, a notice to say we are banning uh, lakeside um, uh, uh, meetings or conferences. And this had a huge impact. You can imagine that we're just coming from the COVID pandemic and now the, the, the government is saying no more uh, uh, lakeside visits. And the private sector was, we, we, we were crying to say, so then how do we expect us to survive? We're just coming from a pandemic. But then it hit me to say, you cannot just build a hotel and then relying on the meetings from government. There's something else that you must be giving, you know. So the poor people out of the 19 million Malawians are many. So you are making your money through volumes when you involve those kind of people. You need to make products that those poor people can also uh, access. And that's how we can demystify uh, tourism. And with that, what we want to do is to launch a massive, massive local domestic um, uh, tourism campaign that is also going to involve the president and high-end high people and everybody else. That We get everybody else involved because you don't get the community involved in anything. It won't be sustainable. And this is what we want to do. And this is what we want to leave as our legacy to the next generation. The second thing is about how do we harness the issues of external tourism. So when people come, all of you, I need to see you in Malawi. But when you come here in Malawi, how do you access Malawi? Because usually the, first, the questions that are coming to say, oh, so how, what, which flight do I take? How do I get to Malawi? And when you get to Malawi, you land at the airport. How do you access these places that we want to do access? You know, and then there's issues of the accessibility. There's issues of connectivity. There's issues of security. And then above everything else, there's issues of service. So it's about coordination. How do we coordinate everything else? Because some of these things, especially most of these things, it's not a means of uh, tourism that is going to uh, uh, achieve this or deliver this. It's going to be everybody else, other ministries that are going to be involved. So how do we work uh, on those things? And then the third thing for me is about how now do we develop, bring in the investors to help us uh, to implement the master plan that I've just talked about. So for the master plan, you can go to our website, www.visitmalawi.mw. That's where you can download uh, the master plan. So for me, I don't want people to come to say because they are looking at the monetary value of their investments in Malawi. I want it to make sense to them. I want them to blend them, their investment with the culture of people. I want this to make sense to them. I don't want them to say, oh, we invest in Malawi, but we have we've put out because there's, there's, there's no business and whatever. No, I want them to invest in Malawi for something else much, much bigger than profit. And if we can achieve that, we would have achieved a lot of things in my country. So this is what uh, I would want to do in the short period of time that I'm going to be with the Minister of Tourism, and I will rely on all of you. And I was just talking to Mark, and I was saying, uh, he was saying, do you understand anything about the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy? I'm like, I really don't. I've never heard about it, but it actually makes sense to me. I mean, we, you actually have an Institute of, of, of Cultural Diplomacy, and I would want to see how to find ways of how we can connect. We just created a school of government uh, in Malawi, and I'm thinking that maybe they can partner together. But also, I'm studying uh, for my PhD with a certain university. I'm thinking that maybe there are other synergies that we can uh, connect to and then work together between the institution and the university in Malawi. And this is how you build relationships relationships because at the end of the day you need relationships to get ahead in life anywhere else you know you can have 10 million dollars here and then you drop dead here or you 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 you, you knock out and then your money is not going to take you to the hospital you still need human beings and uh, i think we are good at that as, as a people as a culture and as a nation and so with those uh, few remarks uh, I, I am really grateful that you could uh, uh, have me here and thank you so much uh, for listening thank you would like to begin it looks like Yes, um, <coughs> thank you very much for your speech. Um, I'm Didem, I'm working for the Institute. At the same time, I have a PhD in climate politics. Um, so that's why where I'm coming from as a direction. Because um, I always wonder, obviously we are going to promote tourism here, but at the same time, I think like, I mean, flying is such a huge carbon footprint. So I myself don't fly because I'm always thinking of the global south and I don't feel I'm entitled to flying because the suffering happens somewhere else by, while I'm super privileged. <laughs> so I wonder how you like find the balance between promoting tourism, but at the same time being conscious of the uh, impact of global tourism and so on. Like, um, yeah, how do we best find a balance between obviously supporting sustainable tourism and at the same time also like trying mm -hmm. to keep within the climate accord of Paris? Okay, I can take a few uh, before I, I respond. My name is Ariwola. Um, you said something uh, about uh, blending investment with, with culture. And uh, I believe that tourism involves 
a lot of sectors like trade, investment, and uh, health sector. And you mentioned something about outbreak of cholera recently. Um, I want you to explain how a tourist can have that social peace when trying to visit Malawi. You can hear me at the yes. back? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start with the second one. A very important question. How do tourists, uh, or anybody for that matter, or even an investor, uh, find social peace uh, in, a, in a country that has uh, a cholera? And by the way, it's not only Malawi. It's, it's, it's an outbreak that is going around within the region, uh, 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 but we are managing it. But I think this is just... The understanding is about what's, what's your end goal. It, 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 it's, it's like saying, oh, we're not, we not going to do this because people have COVID. Or, oh, no, because there's HIV and AIDS, and then we're we are not going to do this. And life doesn't have to come to a standstill because something has gone wrong. Life continues. If, as long as there's life, I think we need to continue. So we're not going to stop doing anything that we're supposed to do for our people because we have, uh, we have cholera. There's everything else that is going on. We are still promoting tourism. So for me, it's about how you... How do you blend? How do you ensure that the system, that there's the infrastructure that is available to manage this, the, 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 the situation at the same time trying to market the country? And so I would like to assure you that it's not a threat uh, uh, to anybody that comes there because, oh, tourists are going to come and then they're going to be uh, affected or infected by uh, cholera and then they're going to die on the shores of Malawi or something like that. We are managing that situation at the moment. And by the way, I think as of uh, yesterday, we had uh, situations where we would have about 30 people dying on a daily basis, which was a headache for the Ministry of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Health. But as of last night, I think it was just only two people that had died. So I think we are going towards the very last part uh, of that pandemic. Usually it's, it happens in, when we are in the rainy season, but for some reason, and people are connecting it actually to climate change. For some reason, uh, the, the, the pandemic started uh, in the summer, and people were like, how does it happen like this? So uh, we are managing that situation. So just to say, I think from people that are in the room, but also out there to say, uh, it's not a threat at the moment to come to Malawi, even in the midst of, of, of the cholera pandemic that we have. Uh, it, everything is under control and people are, would be safe uh, to come visit us. The second issue was uh, on how do you find the balance between tourism and climate change uh, issues? Uh, you know, we have to be compliant to international treaties and regulations and, 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 and all of that. But at the same time, I think this is why I had started in the contextual uh, review that I said this uh, tourism for us is part of our structural transformation uh, economically. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we, we throw everything to the bus or say, oh, we're not going to consider issues of climate change because of all of this. We will try as much as possible to ensure that whatever it is that we're doing tourism-wise is, 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 is sustainable. And that's why we are doing actually much, much better than a lot of countries as far as conservation is concerned. So um, uh, we are, we are a, a trendsetter as far as that is, is, is concerned, and that is going to continue. That's a basis for everything that we're doing. And then the key thing for us is about how we involve the communities that are surrounding these kind of places. In Malawi, I'll tell you, um, um, until the re recently, people look at an elephant as an animal. And so we are now supposed to change that and where people are able to see an elephant as a thing of beauty, you know, to say, without this elephant, my child shouldn't go to school. If it wasn't for this chimpanzee or this gorilla, I shouldn't have that medicine that I got from that health center. And so bringing that community, ensuring that they are involved is the best sustainability that you can ever have. And so that's how we are doing it. So we may, people still need to fly to Malawi if you're coming from Holland, if you're coming from Germany, and there are those implications as far as the ozone layer is concerned. But we'll try to mitigate uh, that on the other conservation areas that we are already uh, doing so well in. Next question. Be shy. Uh, those of you I am not shy, so they better not be shy. Exactly. <laughs> if not, maybe I'll jump in also with a question from my side, and then I'll give, give it back to you. I can go back. Oh, okay. Ladies first. It's okay. Women, Women's Day. Ladies first. I should just give you my card, then we can have this conversation later. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, but I feel like ever, otherwise everybody yeah, is benefiting ahead. from your knowledge too, so yeah. I think it's fine. Um, okay, so um, if I understood it correctly you're trying to like make up for that uh, individually um like for the footprint like i'm gonna fly to malawi but 
with the money that I'm spending there, you making that much conservation that my conscience can be good um, kind of thing. Um, so now I'm wondering about like, have you considered like uh, using climate certifications, using Article Six of the uh, of the last um, agreement, in, in order to like uh, yeah like use the carbon credits because I know many African countries use like the new carbon schemes, loss and damages, and so on to invest in conservation. Um, so I'm just wondering what is the situation? Um, yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. I should have brought that up. We have just, uh, I think uh, we are in the final stages of signing two agreements with, uh, with uh, counterparts on, on carbon credit. And uh, just to let you know that this was, um, um, it's a new phenomenon. I think we've been talking about it for the past three years. And I think at cabinet level, we're like, can we zero in? Can we now go and agree? So there's a huge project that is coming in on, on carbon credit. I think two of them. So we are making headway. My, my, uh, actually, my um, predecessor, the one that was the Minister of Tourism, now he's now Minister of, uh, of Natural Resources. Uh, he's, he's, he's in Doha now with the president uh, in that, at that big meeting. And one of the key issues that they're discussing there would be on, on carbon credit. So uh, we are getting there. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name's Eamon. I'm a student here at ICD. And thank you for that insightful speech. Um, I just have a question because when it comes to traveling, a lot of especially to Africa, a lot of people think about their safety. And so, how safe is Malawi compared to other countries in Africa or even in Europe? Thank you. Just to say that Malawi is one of the safest places in on, in the world, and I think in Africa also. So you'll be hundred percent safe if you come to Malawi. Thank you so much. I think this question came as other questions are coming, especially on the carb, uh, credit and the carbon thing through flying. I've read somewhere that the impact that makes with this flying carbon reducing and uh, offsetting your credits doesn't really make an impact. And it, it could be even just a greenwashing of the climate change instead of making really uh, coming up with good solutions to the challenge of climate change. Mm. While we're still on that, in Malawi is surrounded by other countries that are, have huge tourism. For example, South Africa is not that far. Kenya is in the east, but even Tanzania, all those countries, they have huge tourism. Is, it a way, is there a way where Malawi can harness that when people visit those countries? then there is a possibility or there is an information that they can also come to Malawi on the same trip. Probably that can help. But my question to you is, <coughs> is the Minister for Tourism in Malawi doing anything to work with those countries? You mentioned that you visited the standard IPT to see what other African countries. But let's talk the countries in the region close to Malawi that are already doing big tourism. How can Malawi? harness the people that already visit those countries. So probably they can combine one trip and use a bus or a car or a, another mode of transport to come to Malawi. Thank you. I'm actually smiling as you're speaking because this is the exact uh, meeting that I had today with my counterpart in, Zim in Zimbabwe, uh, the Minister of Tourism in, in Zimbabwe. That's exactly the same kind of conversation that we had. And I think our point of departure, point of departure was we used to be one people. You know, we have, we have actually the base, the same base of language, the, the Bantu language. We used to be one people before all of these uh, demarcations came. But um, so, and then we're saying, uh, because we are having a, one of our greatest challenges about accessibility of, of airlines uh, into Malawi. We have a limited number. And then Zimbabwe, our counterpart, our, our neighbors have about 14 of them. And we're saying, well, the, the same deal that Zimbabwe has, why can't we have it in Malawi? And by the way, we're just um, signing uh, an MOU we, th we had another one. We are renewing it now eh? with, them, with, with Zimbabwe. So we are signing another, uh, an MOU 100% be based on what exactly what you're saying. And we want to have another one with Zambia. We want to have another one with um, Tanzania. Uh, we want to have another one with Mozambique because it, it just makes sense. So, for example, somebody uh, flies into Zimbabwe and then want them to get the bus or whatever it is that they can get and then come to Malawi, then go to Mozambique and then go to that. Because a lot of people do that already. I was, uh, I was uh, told about a certain team that came from Oman 
they landed in Tanzania and then came to Malawi and then they got into Mozambique and then they'll end up in Ethiopia, you know, somewhere there. So these are things that it's very possible for us to do, but I think for a long time we have not taken advantage of, but we are, we are going there. So I think we are renewing our agreement with uh, Zimbabwe uh, for exactly the same, very same purpose. And we'll do another one with Zambia, Mozambique and uh, Tanzania as well. But also I think, I think you heard me, I was saying uh, these countries that you've mentioned, uh, you have Botswana, Tanzania, Zambia, uh, Kenya, yeah, they're very big. Uh, South Africa, very very big uh, on um, on tourism, infrastructure wise, and all of that. But they don't have what we have, which is exactly what I was telling you. So that's what we are leveraging ourselves on: our warmth, our resilience as a people, our culture as a people. So even if we don't have the same infrastructure that they do have, we have something that they don't have, and that's what we are selling as a product. Uh, to the world so yes we'll learn from them we'll partner with them but we'll remain true to who we are we'll maintain our authenticity as a people um uh, i think traveling safety i think i've assured you i want you to come even as a student sir i want you to come to malawi and we'll personally vouch to take care of you and your welfare <laughs> so, yeah. so we will personally ensure that you are safe my guy is just sitting in front of you there. You can get your contact, and I'll really be glad that you should, you should come and visit us. All right. Anything else? Allow me to sit down. <laughs> uh, there's one in the back, and I have one also. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Take part of okay. first. Hey, good, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Cyril from the Philippines. I'm also a student here in ICD. Um, I'm interested because um, you mentioned that um, you just found out about cultural diplomacy. Um, but... In terms of um, promoting Malawi and tourism campaigns, have you also um, uh, used social media as part of um, your strategies in communicating um, what M Malawi has to offer? Um, because I'm, I'm focusing on digital diplomacy and I think um, social media is the way towards um, engaging with the wider public. So I was wondering what you do with that. Thank you. No, thank, thank you so much uh, for that. Yes, we are using uh, uh, social media, but I think maybe not to, uh, we're not loud enough. And this is one of the issues that I've been raising with our marketing department. We actually have uh, an entire marketing department uh, in the ministry that does uh, these uh, communications and all of that. But we need to up our game as far as using social media is concerned. But for me, it's not about just using social media. It's about targeting, you know, which exactly, which one is your audience. So I'll tell you. We're not very big on social media in Malawi. If we, think that we, we have plus or minus 800,000 people that are on Facebook, for example. 800,000, maybe max would be 1 million Malawians that are on Facebook alone. So it's not a very, very big market. But it's about how you leverage social media with a, even the outside world, the region, and then our counterparts in Europe, America, and all of that. So, yes, we are getting there. And then, yeah, digital diplomacy, that's one of the issues that we want to do. But also, I think there was something else that was coming to my mind as I, I think I was supposed to have uh, uh, responded to this in, in the, the last question on the, on the, the impact of uh, uh, the, 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 the carbon credits, uh, the climate change, and all of that. We're investing a lot uh, in terms of research and development uh, as a country. We have a, a university of science and technology that is looking at all of these things. So that's one of the areas where we have, uh, uh, we have interest in. But also we have a, a pool of young people. Surprisingly, they, I've, I've been to conferences with Malawian young people, and I'm like, this happened here? Amazing. They're building drones. They're building all of these things uh, in, in, in Malawi. Incredible. Something that we never thought would happen um, uh, to us. So I want to assure you that the generation that we are raising at the moment is tech savvy. And they are going to take it home as far as we are concerned. So yeah, as a ministry, we may not be that much higher on, in terms of digital diplomacy. But we are working with a, a pool of population that is under the age of 35. About 76% of uh, our population is under the age of 35. And they are the ones that are doing these things and who will leverage uh, on that as far as digital uh, diplomacy is concerned. I wanted to ask you a question about the role of the Malawi diaspora in terms of tourism development. 
As an outsider looking in, the statistics show us that actually the population of the African diaspora technically is larger than the population of the African continents. Socioeconomically, usually also in stronger situations, which explains why the Western Union flows go in one direction, not, not in both. So my question is, what role does the diaspora have, or could they have, in promoting tourism and also developing further tourism? Because of course, what's interesting with the diaspora, they really are, are a bridge between both countries. Of um, is there an office for diaspora affairs, or does that also factor into the development strategy of Malawi's tourism? Yes, absolutely. And also, otherwise, uh, we, that's why I, I was saying that 19 million Malawians are tourism officers. We want to ensure that everything that I know, everything that I was saying, somebody in the remotest place of Malawi should be able to tell you the same thing. The only thing that they will not tell you would be about policies, regulations, a lot of that, that I should know because I, I'm a public official. But everybody should be able to articulate these things that I'm saying to you. And so we want our, our, our Malawians in the diaspora to also look at the same things. But I think for a long time, the diaspora was not really put in sync uh, with, with, with home. So, you know, like the embassy here is also looking after other uh, 22 countries, 22, 24? 24 other other countries and I want to believe that there's a Malawian in those all those 24 but in terms of how I, I don't know I don't even know if they have a database because the, the ideal situation is that our embassy should have a, um, a a database of all Malawians in that country and then engage them because some of these people want to have um, w what you call they have, they have specific interests others would have specific interests in health in tourism, in education, in whatever. They should be given an opportunity to do those things. But also, they're working for various institutions that may, may bring to us, maybe, uh, or be a bridge with investors, for example. We want to harness that. But also, socioeconomically, they have uh, the, the much needed forex that we, we don't have. And so I know uh, for a fact that uh, as far as the Ministry of Finance and Treasury is concerned, they are working on a, on, on a specific program to on how we can engage uh, with the diaspora as far as economic uh, economic issues are concerned back home and uh, i think uh, for me that, that that goes a long way in town in kenya i think they've actually created a ministry of the diaspora which which shows the commitment of the government to uh, as to how they want to engage the people that are outside their country uh, to invest back home so i think we are going the same direction we don't necessarily have a, a, a ministry in that regard but we will use the Ministry of foreign affairs for now uh, to do the coordination among the people that are outside the country. But it's an avenue that we have seen that we have not taken advantage of. A lot of Malawians will say, oh, I wanted this information. I didn't know where to go. And so we want to create an interface between the people that are there within the embassy. They should have every information that they want. Tomorrow evening, I'm meeting the diaspora in, in Germany uh, uh, from the ambassador's uh, residence. He's been so kind as to uh, host us tomorrow night. So I'm meeting uh, members of the diaspora, and this is one of the issues that we are also going to be uh, talking about. So I think for, my, for me, it's about how intentional are you as a government to ensure that you are engaging people. Because as, when people are here, and then they're living a very good life, they have nothing to lose. But we see that there's that opportunity that we are missing that we need to be seeing as far as the, uh, our people are concerned that are here. Because eventually some of them may be coming back home, and home is best. So uh, they will be come back to what? So it's also in their interest that they also invest uh, back home. Well, I think it's, it's uh, very important, and I think I'd, I'd love to even you know work with the embassy together to see if we can strengthen that, because I think one of the best ways to get to know a country is to get to know as many of its citizens as possible. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges, as discussed before, air flare, flights, visas, yeah. et cetera, and the great thing with the diaspora, they're already there. So yeah. it's actually really just as easy, even though it's difficult, to coordinate it, to somehow get in touch with them, maybe give them a symbolic role as honorary <laughs> cultural ambassador of Malawi or something. Yeah. They would be honored probably to have such a title, uh, and then they can actually do the work together with you. Uh, uh, they usually know the languages of the countries they're in, as well as also in Malawi. So it's definitely, I think, an interesting uh, opportunity that you could be explored without much finances and without much effort. Absolutely. So. And I think you've heard, so please take it home. The other thing, I think, as you were speaking, you, you spoke about something else. And I think it has something to do with our accessibility as a, as a country. So I, I didn't mention it in my speech, but I wanted to mention it, which is the fact that we have removed, we have waived the visa for, for, for about 15 European countries. Uh, just that's to show our commitment as a government to say, we want you to come here, so we'll remove. You come, you just stamp in your, in your passport um, when you arrive at the airport. So because I think people are having challenges as far as visa applications online are concerned because we would have connectivity issues. So if they are having challenges connecting, uh, getting a visa to Malawi, they have alternatives. They'll go to Zambia, they'll go to Z Zambia, they'll go to Zimbabwe, where they don't have to pay the visas. So we have waived. Uh, that visa. So I think all of you here, you can come to Malawi without a visa. We have waived that. So 
uh, that's something that also we are, we are uh, leveraging on. Uh, maybe just a second question, and then I'll give it back to you in case there's, there's others. Uh, of course, I have to ask you a question about cultural diplomacy, since you're here at the yeah. ICD Academy for Cultural Diplomacy. I'm not aware of official cultural diplomacy of Malawi. Uh, so as far as I know, I think it's done you know, from time to time as part of the overall diplomatic efforts. Uh, but I there also see an opportunity that I think the more cultural diplomacy Malawi does, uh, the more misinformation can be corrected about Malawi, and the more supplemental information about opportunities yeah. for trade, for investment, for tourism. Yeah. Uh, and I have many conversations, for example, with the ambassador of uh, Burundi. Uh, we do a lot of cooperation. And I always tell her, uh, she, she always complains, ah, we don't have a budget for cultural diplomacy, we have a small embassy, this, that, etc. And I always say, take those weaknesses and yeah. use them as strengths. Absolutely. The fact that you have a small embassy is good. I mean, you have to get out of the embassy. Exactly. Partner with organizations like us. Go to the German government. Go to German foundations. It'll be easier for you and faster to reach German audiences because the German institutions have them already. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, I also mention this again for the embassy as well as for you when you come home to talk to your other ministries. Uh, I think without really much efforts and even without extra costs, one could also have additional efforts of cultural diplomacy that mm -hmm. would then also translate into more tourism, into more business. Uh, so therefore, I'm very happy to brainstorm with you, also the colleagues from the embassy, to see how, how it can be done. Uh, I think even without additional budgets, without additional staff. Uh, and I think also, I always tell this to, to many of my African uh, friends, there are a number of African institutions here in Berlin. There's also an African house, uh, but they're relatively minimal efforts. Uh, and what I always think is if the African embassies were to get together and go to the German government and say, we would like to create an Africa house where we have really a serious infrastructure to present African culture, mm -hmm. I think you get the building for free. Yep. Uh, and I think that would be Germany very well received. It wouldn't cost anything. And suddenly that would be a way of upping uh, the, the game, as you were saying, uh, and really putting also the African countries more on the, 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 the map. So something to think about as well. I think really there's, there's openness, there's readiness also yep. on the German side. It's really just a matter of making the effort and, and going to them. Uh, again, ICD would be happy to jump in there as well if, if we can uh, accelerate these efforts, strengthen the institutions that already exist, uh, and hopefully uh, go to the goals we were talking about before uh, to increase the tourism. So just as a plug for cultural diplomacy. Yeah, I think I think in the, in, the, in the bilateral discussion that we're going to have later, I think I'm going to articulate what the embassy is planning, because I think they've told us that um, they want to get together all these African regions and then they want to have, be having maybe monthly parties or engagements, you know. So I think when, when you really look closely, the fundamental issues or challenges that Africans would be facing will be the same, you know, regard, regardless of our the socioeconomic status. It doesn't really matter what kind of, how, how much your GDP is or whatever. The fundamentals of the issues that we are facing would be the same. And so when these ones come, the diplomats in Berlin, they come together, they talk about this, it's, it's a social gathering, but they're talking about, the, they're creating a forum deliberately, intentionally, to say we want to come together as Africans. So they cannot just be meeting for a party, they can be meeting in those things to say we want as Africans, then we want to engage accordingly, and then we use cultural diplomacy to advance specific issues. I think somebody's going to start listening. So it's, it's, it's an avenue that I'm, I'm thinking that could be taken up. And also you leverage on the fact that they are already starting to uh, organize and mobilize uh, themselves. Yeah. No, I would again agree, and I think a party can also be a good place to start. Of course. Uh, we had some good examples of this uh, summer. We had a big event uh, initiated by Embassy of Peru, but also there were many Latin American embassies there. 2,000 people outdoors. You may have seen we have an outdoor stage. They had 10 food trucks. One of them was Cuban food. One of them was Venezuelan food, etc. Uh, again, it didn't cost them, but actually they earned some money on the sale from the food and the drinks, and it was a great success. Uh, so I think that can be a great way sometimes to yeah. start, bring the diaspora together with the German counterparts, etc., and then could be followed up by also more, more formal issues. So yeah. don't underestimate the party, the power of a of course. party. Of uh, course. <laughs> and then some people talk when they have had a few a few shots of gin. So yeah, yeah I think it makes the it. The culture <laughs> of gin, which, which I think it. we will also be able to experience as yeah, far yeah. as I know oh, from, of course. from the buffet. Yeah, the, test the Malawi gin. Yeah. Uh, they have very kindly brought us also some tastes of Malawi yes. uh, to follow the, the discussion. But before we move to the cultural part and the tastes of Malawi, are there any other questions or comments from, from anyone in the audience? If not, we can continue it, as you said, over a taste of gin, or I think also some other snacks uh, from Malawi. But yeah. let's then, first of all, express our sincere gratitude to the minister and also to the embassy for making this possible today. Thank you.